So Hamas, we can put up this Reuters element here. Hamas uh, has uh, responded to the uh, Biden slash Israel proposal, the word, and we'll talk about this in, in a moment, uh, saying that uh, it opens a broad pathway was one of the quotes that they had. And they said they had a couple of amendments uh, to the Israeli proposal, but in general said that they were now simply negotiating uh, details around the final terms of a ceasefire uh, for this war. Now, Israeli authorities have put a different spin on it. Uh, you can put up Barack Ravid here at, at Axios. Uh, Israeli officials telling Axios, Israel received Hamas's response. Hamas rejected the proposal for a hostage deal, which was laid out by President Biden uh, in his speech. Hamas is saying that is not the case, that they're not rejecting it, that they have a few uh, quibbles around uh, the edges. So. Let's let's move let's move through these here. Uh, you can put up uh, Blinken, who landed in Qatar, uh, landed in Qatar the, today, uh, pressing forward with this with these negotiations. Um, here is Blinken yesterday, uh, laying out uh, his position on everybody else's position. First, let me be very clear: Israel has accepted the proposal. Uh, in fact, uh, they were critical in putting it forward. So the only party. No, that's, that, is what, that is what the official position of the Israeli government and the prime minister. Um, so the only party that has not accepted, the only party that's not said yes, is Hamas. Meanwhile, uh, Netanyahu has called uh, the, the proposal, the Israeli proposal, uh, a non-starter if it does not allow Israel to indefinitely uh, continue the war until Hamas is dismantled. But that's not what the agreement itself says, and Israel has acknowledged that it did send this agreement uh, to Hamas, the agreement that Biden then uh, elevated to try to trap Netanyahu into accepting it. On CNN, there was an interesting exchange which shows that uh, what's going on here is Israel is willing to accept the deal that they put forward, but that doesn't necessarily mean they, quote unquote, support it. Some in interesting uh, linguistic gymnastics here. Let's roll CNN from last night. But this deal is Israel's proposal. Why can't Netanyahu say outright that, that he supports it? Uh, well, I don't know what he said to uh, Secretary Blinken today when they met. He but the fact that I, that the fact that I wasn't instructed to speak out against the deal means that we accept the deal. Does it? Uh, wouldn't it mean that you support it if you could come out and say you supported it? But I'm, I'm saying here that we accept the deal. Again, it pretty much depends on the way it will be interpreted by the negotiators. We, because Hamas, you're let's saying, say... From Ambassador, moving, you're saying we, we support it, but... You're not just saying unequivocally that Israel does support it. Because the words are very important. Because when, it, when you say that if the negotiations continues after six weeks, we need to continue with the ceasefire so Hamas can exploit... Uh, this clause and continue with endless and meaningless uh, negotiations that means nothing. Obviously, that wasn't the meaning of President Biden. So that's the key difference there, that the, the proposal says that after the first phase, which would include uh, hostage, ex uh, hostage exchanges, the uh, elderly uh, women, others uh, who are in, in, infirm and at risk would be released in exchange for a significant number of uh, Palestinian hostages that are held in, in detention by uh, Israel. After that, there would be six weeks of negotiations toward a permanent ceasefire, uh, although the Israeli proposal says lasting ceasefire. Hamas, in its, in its response, wants to change that from lasting ceasefire to permanent ceasefire. But the key point that the ambassador was making there is that uh, they, they, if the negotiations are still ongoing, in six weeks, the agreement says that the ceasefire should continue as long as the negotiations are making progress. Israel is saying that it wants the right at that moment to relaunch its war. And what some of Netanyahu's allies have said to him in getting him to agree to this is like, is look, you can restart the war after six weeks if you want to, like no matter what this agreement says. And they've argued that Hamas will do something that will, that will give you a green light to go ahead and do that. And if not, you can also, you can always manufacture something. Uh, so th that he was zeroing in on this kind of pause, this, this six week gap between phase one and phase two seems to be uh, the central distinction here. Um, Emily, we, we've seen 
this just kind of uh, head spinning uh, game back and forth where you continue to have Blinken saying, no, uh, the Israeli government supports this. And you'll, you'll have Netanyahu right next to him practically saying, nope, don't support this, don't support this. He's like, nope, de definitely supports this. Uh, Blinken was at, Blinken met with Netanyahu yesterday and he was asked, did, did Netanyahu explicitly say that he supported this? And, and Blinken said, yes, like he did. Uh, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, the UN ambassador, uh, was, asked, was asked to explain this, to say, you keep saying Israel supports this. Israel keeps saying that they do not. Like, how do you fill in that gap? And she said, look, I can't, you know, they have some, whatever domestic political concerns that they have that are leading them to say this, basically, uh, you'll have to ask them about it. But in private, in discussions with us, they have been very clear that they accept this. If let's, let's, use, the, let's use his term. And, and he makes a good point, that the, the, the official, the Israeli official there, that the fact that Netanyahu um, did not instruct him to oppose it at the UN, despite the fact that previously uh, the Israeli ambassador to the UN said that they would oppose it at the UN. They don't get a vote, but they said that they would oppose it uh, because it's a, it's a security council and they're not on the security council. Uh, that alone tells you that they're willing to, quote unquote, accept it. Uh, so uh, do you think we've, we're, do you think we're getting to a place where we actually sort of now understand what's going on here? Mm. Yes, I agree with that, and I do think we are, um, because I think Israel is increasingly aware, as I'm sure Hamas is, that the difference between lasting and permanent will ultimately be who can use that illusion uh, as, a cuddle, as a cudgel uh, sooner or more effectively, because we all know that this is not going to be a lasting or permanent peace. And is the, the reporting that you just mentioned um, about Israel in the negotiation sort of internally over there, says what we all know. This is not lasting. This is not a permanent ceasefire. That's an illusion uh, or maybe a delusion. But I, I don't even think there's anybody delusional enough to think that that's the case. Meanwhile, though, lives hang in the balance uh, amidst our ability to at least agree to the illusion, to at least agree in theory, to at least agree on paper. And that's a very strange place to be. Uh, it, it's sort of obvious that you know, we, we know that a sticking point between lasting and permanent is really who can then turn around and say a, a permanent or lasting ceasefire was broken most effectively uh, because it, that's inevitably what's going to happen. Um, so, yeah, I think that's what's being discussed right now. Or that's what's being considered by both sides right now. And I don't think that's necessarily uh, categorically a bad thing because it could save lives. It could be a stopgap uh, as a, a better solution is worked out. Now, I'm not optimistic. Less deadly, less violent solution is, not worked, is worked out. Now, I'm not optimistic that could happen. But a pause in hostilities right now, um, there are lives hanging in the balance. There's famine hanging in the balance. Uh, so uh, categorically, while it may be a, sort of frustrating uh, for people watching this play out, mm -hmm. um, you know, people really could be saved and protected by this. You also have a wild scenario where you could have them agree to this six-week uh, pause, uh, do, do a hostage exchange, and then see the war kick back up again at the end mm -hmm. of July, right between mm -hmm. the Republican and the Democratic con conventions. And a lot of Democrats are worried because they know that Netanyahu or they believe that Netanyahu prefers a Trump presidency. And so yeah. you, you basically you know, have your, your political adversary, who is your geopolitical ally, uh, has the ability to harm you, you know, in your own domestic politics. Now, uh, what, what, his own, what Netanyahu's own domestic political situation would be like at that point uh, is, is, not, is not even clear. And on the Hamas side, you certainly have elements that are opposed to a ceasefire, that believe Aya Sinwar uh, was quoted in the Wall Street Journal with uh, some uh, intercepted cables saying, we have Israel exactly where we want them. You know, that, mm -hmm. the, that, they, that, that Israel continues committing uh, atrocities, war crimes, uh, that they continue to get international condemnation for that, and the, uh, and the isolation of Israel globally continues, which is which is the Hamas goal. Now, Israel doesn't have to play into Hamas's hands by continuing 
to commit atrocities and, and war crimes. And, 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 and they have, I think, well, move, move this, put that aside. They don't have to, but, you know, Sinwar believes that they will continue to do that. You know, as, as long as the war is going on, there, there will, every couple of days, be something that shocks and horrifies the world, which then, you know, further degrades Israel's position internationally, uh, which uh, puts then, which puts Hamas in a position where um, they, they have some advantage in not obtaining a ceasefire, which is, okay, that's, and that's according to Sinwar himself. And, you know, the Palestinian people are out of, you know, they, mm-hmm. they feel like they're out of options. And so, you know, there was a, a poignant quote, I forget which uh, publication ran with it this week after the hostage rescue uh, from a Palestinian who said, what, what were they doing in relation to Hamas? Uh, they knew that this hostage rescue was going to result in, you know, the deaths of dozens, if not hundreds, which it's looking uh, like a very, very high number of casualties. And, you know, without another sort of governing body, without, you know, someone else prosecuting the war on their side, the, Hamas has a monopoly, basically, on their political expressions. Um, and so, you know, Hamas can afford to lose the support of the Palestinian people to a degree uh, in a way that Israel cannot really afford to lose the support uh, completely of the United States, certainly, and people around the world. And that leads us to this next clip. Uh, the, the politics of this for Joe Biden are increasingly difficult in the middle of an election system, or in the middle of an election cycle. Let's take a look at this next clip of uh, Biden being hit with some protesters, uh, verbally being hit with some protesters, just recently. Out of my heart. No, 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 no. Folks. Folks, it's okay. Look. They care. Innocent children have been lost. They make a full point. Come on now. Thank you for honoring gun violence survivors. So that was a clip from yesterday at a Moms Demand Action gun event. Uh, by the way, just hours after the Hunter Biden gun conviction, sort of an odd juxtaposition there. But <laughs> Uh, Ryan, this is going to follow him everywhere and could get even more heated. I mean, we've seen the encampments actually return to campuses. UCLA, I think one popped up again at Columbia. It's not going anywhere for Biden. There's there's no question about it. And a peace deal is obviously in his interest. Donald Trump campaigned hard on the Abraham. Uh, Donald Trump is campaigning hard on the Abraham Accords. Um, so, well, you know, Biden obviously wants to have something like that in his quiver. Yeah, and. His response there, I thought, was noteworthy in the sense that is much different than it had been in the past. Like in the past, mm. when he has gotten protested, uh, he would he would just kind of thunder through, and he would mm-hmm. he would urge on the f- chance of four more years, and then he would say, you know, uh, I am a steadfast supporter of Israel. Israel has a right to defend herself. And he, instead, this time, he said. He was trying to stop the chance of four more years and to say, no, listen, the protesters, they, they make a point. A lot of children, he said, he had to do the passive voice. Um, but I th- and I think he tried to say they make a fair point. It, can't, it came out as they make a, f- a f- point. Uh, but I think he was trying to, to sympathize with the protesters there. And I think that that reflects his, his shift in how he's viewing this and how like, he is really now trying to force a ceasefire deal onto the two parties. Uh, it's it's funny that he has m- kind of just willed uh, the Netanyahu government into accepting its own proposal that they kind of reluctantly put forward, will, you know, will, willing it into being by putting it forward and then insisting against all of the Israeli op- opposition that they support it. It'd be interesting if he just took the same approach to Hamas. Hamas is like, no, we don't support this as it's written. We have some amendments, and uh, you just you just send uh, Blinken out there to say, no, nope, Hamas told us they support it. That'd be an interesting new way of doing diplomacy, if you just ignored what people I'm said definitely. and just <laughs> assert what the what the reality is, and just kind of I mean, will I kind it of feel into like we've being. Seen that. 
Sort of. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I kind of feel like we've seen that. And it's this, again, we've talked about this so many times, the uneven nature of having one major component or one major party to this war before a two-state solution and the other major party to this war, the most major party to this war, Israel, being in favor of a one-state solution, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sort of bridging that gap between the two uh, <clears throat> most consequential governments uh, is leading to some predictably bizarre results I'm glad you said that, though, Ryan, because I agree. I had a similar reaction. I thought that was politically, I'm um, just speaking about Joe Biden's performance as a politician, uh, which has you know, nosedived in recent years. That was vintage Biden. That was the version of Joe Biden uh, that you know people thought maybe had a shot in 2008 and actually back years before that, too. Um, you know, he, he does have this reflex um, to offer compassion. Uh, in a way that is sort of casual, relatable, believable. And uh, I think it was wise of him to do that uh, in the moment that he, he had those protests. Now, politically, of course, it was wise of him because this isn't going anywhere. We'll follow him, literally follow him throughout the rest of the campaign, and you can't just ignore it. I th and I think that's a good point because the, the American public knowing and the global public knowing that one of, the, one of the only things, if you only know one thing about Joe Biden, you know that he has this incredible ability to empathize and, and to feel your pain. Uh, and to know that about him, and then to see him show so little compassion for, for the plight of people in Gaza over the, over the past eight months, up until that clip, basically, I think made it hit that much harder for so many people. Because people were like, we know that this, we know that you do know how to show compassion. We know that you do understand what this loss is like. And for you to not be willing to go anywhere near showing that compassion, I think uh, just hit much deeper. Uh, speaking of people not being able to go anywhere, Jake Sullivan, who was getting protested at his own row house here in DC this morning, also got hit by protesters at, his, at an event uh, yesterday. We can roll this. Jake, thank you for being here with us today. We know. Jake Sullivan, you are a war criminal. 15,000 people, 15,000 kids dead is not self-defense. Jake Sullivan, you are a war criminal. Jake Sullivan, you are a war criminal. 15,000 children dead is not self-defense. 15,000 kids dead is not, is not self-defense. 15,000 children dead is not self-defense. And the context for these ceasefire talks down in the South is really what's going on uh, in the North. Mm -hmm. If we can put up C7 here. Uh, so yesterday in an airstrike, Israel killed a top uh, Hezbollah commander, Abu Taleb. Uh, Hezbollah responded with one of its most uh, furious assaults on Israel since the kind of uh, low-level war between the two of them began after uh, October 7th, uh, and Hezbollah has had uh, a, a worrying amount of effect in being able to combat Israel's uh, air superiority, you know, from the, from the Israeli uh, perspective. Uh, they've knocked out uh, millions of dollars worth of Israeli drones, or American drones, I should say, from, from the sky, uh, even uh, managed, to, managed to hit uh, a, an Iron Dome uh, launch system, which is uh, which is which is kind of shocking to kind of this uh, Israeli political system, uh, and you know ha has much uh, a much more serious arsenal uh, and ability to kind of rearm uh, than Hamas. Like the, there's just no question inside Israel, all of the attention is pivoting toward the north. Um, there are about a hundred thousand plus uh, Israelis who have evacuated from um, areas in the in the north. Uh, which is which is creating a, you know, a huge kind of housing crisis inside Israel, coupled with the, the evacuations of so many people from the south as well. Uh, and uh, there's this real push to get, move this low-level war to a much higher-level war uh, with with Lebanon. Uh, but it, it's not clear that uh, you know Israel has the capacity to to do what it it thinks it needs to do in in that area. 
And, you know, this is really zooming out, but it, just as you were talking, I'm thinking about what's happening right now. People, there was a tweet that was like, I bet you didn't have Cuban Missile Crisis 2.0 on your bingo card for 2024. <laughs> and Got to be careful not to, you know, give the warmongers uh, too much fodder. But it's true that Russian ships, I mean, their own by their own admission, uh, Russian Navy flotilla has been making its way around the world. They said to raise the flag, basically. Um, that's what Russian media has said. And what we know now is that uh, U.S. warships have followed those Russian ships. Uh, we know, obviously, that Russia, Cuba, Iran, Venezuela, we could talk about why, but uh, we know that there are alliances to throw China into the mix. Uh, we know that there's a, another front uh, or there's another hot war in Ukraine right now. Basically, what I think makes sense about zooming out here is to underline how fragile the ecosystem is right now, um, because it, it does feel like, you know, we've talked about what it looked like in the run-up to World War One, and, you know, does anyone know that a world war starts when it starts? Um, you know, usually not, but they're really, these are really scary times because I think the sort of geopolitical ecosystem is at its most fragile point in a long time. Mm -hmm. Right, and to underline your point, this is after the U.S. greenlit um, Ukraine using U.S. weapons to strike um, in, into some targets inside Russia. Now you've got these, this Russian flotilla um, down by the southeast, southeastern United States and, you know, the U.S. responding. If you add a, let's say, a carpet bombing or, you know, ma a major bombing of Beirut to that and what, how does, how does mm -hmm. Iran respond to that? Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's dark. Hey, if you liked that video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to Breaking Points. If you want to see the rest of CounterPoints, go to breakingpoints.com to become a premium member and get the full uncut show every morning in your inbox and on Spotify.